For ZDNet, I'm Dan Patterson. One of the very practical implications of generative AI like ChatGPT is a restructuring, a rethinking of the search engine landscape that has for the last two decades been dominated by Google. Today's interview is with AI ethicist and CEO of U.com, Richard Socher. And Richard talks about the way AI is changing stuff that you and I as consumers, as well as businesses, use every single day. Search seems obvious until you rethink it with AI. Listen to what Richard has to say. Um, Richard, I, I hear everybody hears a ton about uh, generative AI and these kind of leaps that chat GPT is making with, uh, you know, the new GPT-4. And there's a ton of hyperbole about, well, this is maybe going to kill Google. They are in this kind of innovator's dilemma where they built this very robust product and they serve their clients very well, but they are now kind of susceptible to being undercut by new innovations like chat GPT. So what is, what is the reality of um, the search landscape right now. Are we going to be searching with chatbots? Is Google truly threatened? It's a good question. Uh, I think we've seen actually several waves of people trying to find Google alternatives last year alone. You saw for a while people saying, oh, if I have to add site colon Reddit to all my Google queries to see what real people are still saying and not just commercial content. Uh, then you saw uh, New York Times and others writing about how um, TikTok is replacing Google uh, for some Gen Z use cases. Uh, and then you saw ChatGPT and people are saying, oh, that's the, the next Google killer. The truth is that you can build a better experience. Uh, and at U.com, we've actually incorporated all of these ideas. There's a TikTok app. There's a Reddit app. You can select them whether you like them or not as sources and see them more often or not. Uh, and uh, it's also true that there's been a ton of improvements in the field of natural language processing and AI, yet the biggest application of it all, which is search, hasn't really improved that much in recent years. And so that, that is kind of the uh, opportunity for us as a small startup at U.com to improve uh, and, and work. Now, the traffic hasn't changed massively uh, for Google yet. Uh, but we are seeing millions of users now. Before we launched UChat in December, we had hundreds of thousands of users. Now we have millions of users. And, and so the, there is some reality to this shift. But it's also true that there's a ton of moat that Google has built by owning the operating system, owning the browser, um, owning you know, a $15 billion a year partnership with Apple so that you know, they stay the default and have no one think about it. And so it's going to take a while. You have to be pretty excited about search. We've been excited about it for a while. We've improved, we've grown for a while. Um, it's time to just keep doing that. And it is certainly an exciting time now that a lot more people are thinking, wow, I could actually have a better search experience that's vastly different. Yeah, uh, no pun intended, but you are actually one of the best people to talk to about these innovations in search engines. And I think one of the things you're referring to when uh, users put at Reddit or plus Reddit at the end of a search or use TikTok instead is the reaction to, or at least a perceived reaction to, a lot of Google search engines are just kind of crummy. I, I have a dog and a kid, and if you search anything related to children or pets, uh, it's hard not to see these seo posts that are fairly low quality, which kind of brings up this interesting issue that a lot of people have uh, also pointed out that uh, search engine optimization is an automated process. It, it is built by some forms of artificial intelligence and um, it's running now on search engines that are just as automated. How do we, how do we fix this? How do we clean it up? I mean, one way uh, is what we've done at U.com, which is we actually gave users control over some of the biggest sources that they may or may not like. Uh, in this app store that was launched also last year, you can kind of do a thumbs down or thumbs up on a different source like Reddit, and then you'll see that source more often or less often. I think giving users more control is, is step one. I think step two 
is to actually rely more on natural language processing and AI capabilities such as chat. And so we, you know, launch chat first next to the links. Now uh, the links are, uh, you know, for, for some interesting uh, partnership uh, issues and, and other reasons were the default again, but we've comp like we've resolved all of those and now we can soon uh, be fully chat first and then have links still on the side to support some of that useful summary that chat can provide. And so I think in this new chat world, if your SEO block doesn't add any new content to the chat summary, it, it's not going to be as relevant. So, uh, you know, uh, Bing has added similar features and I know it has been in you.com for quite a while. Um, look, is this a, a novelty or is this a feature that actually adds value, not just to users, but to business as well? Yeah, so uh, certainly to users, you know, we're just we're, we've seen a lot of growth uh, since we've launched UChat, uh, and millions of people enjoy this. It takes a while, right? Uh, Google is probably one of the most ingrained online habits <clears throat> that we have, uh, and uh, you know, it's still a verb uh, to Google something. It's like it used to be a verb to Skype your friends, um, and that doesn't mean you know that that those verbs can change. Um, and I think it's more than a novelty. You know, their novelty is like, oh, I make an AI portrait of myself. That's like a one-time use case. But you do still want to search for things. And if that search engine is more and more of an accomplishment engine, it helps you get things done rather than be inundated with SEO uh, content or ads, then I think you, you can eventually users realize this. And you can follow me on Twitter. At, you know, Richard Socher is my handle. And, and you'll see a lot of users and, you know, I retweet some of that user love uh, that say, wow, why, why would I ever go back to Google? And they're just like, it is their default now. And that's sort of been the tough balance, right? Because as a search engine, there are a lot of use cases. You want to have images, you want to see directions, the stock market, the weather and so on. So it is more than just pure chat. If you really want to replace the search engine in a consistent default uh, kind of manner, uh, but we've, we're, we're doing it, it's happening. Uh, okay, so uh, how? Let me challenge you on that. Google is the incumbent; they aren't just the eight hundred pound gorilla; they're the eight million pound gorilla. And many organizations have tried to challenge their incumbency. Bing, owned by Microsoft, a trillion dollar tech company, uh, has had uh, mixed results. So how do how do you and how do other incumbents or how do other upstarts challenge Google's incumbency? I mean. How? Like you see it, you go to u.com and you'll see how we do it. Um, but you're right, it's going to take some time. There are going to be partnerships that get unlocked uh, once we have private ads going. Um, and, and those partnerships are going to be very important. The Vivaldi browser, for instance, already included us as one of the defaults. And then I think a big part of it is innovation. There's also some uh, tiredness of folks with big tech uh, and not having control. Uh, and we're you know giving control the most novel AI capabilities you usually find on you.com and then maybe uh, a quarter uh, or a year later, others will copy them. And so that will attract a, a certain set of people who want to know and use the latest and greatest AI technology uh, and be in the know before, you know, their, their grandfather also gets to see it uh, a few months or years later on some bigger big tech search engine. And what about what about Google themselves? Um, look, I know you've built a competitor, but um, it, and they they kind of fell on their face with their uh, barred announcement. But Google is a very competent company. Tell me about the next like six, twelve, eighteen months of Google and generative AI. They're not going to miss this forever. Yeah, it's a really interesting conundrum. And, and like you said, there is a classic innovator's dilemma that reminds me very much of Kodak having invented the digital camera, but then having such good margins with film cameras that they didn't really want to see that future through. Google's research team had invented the transformer, but they didn't really want to see this new chat technology take over their entire immense margin business. And so it's just going to take them some time to finagle things. and. You know, it's true. Eventually they did this like maps, YouTube, YouTube, they lost money for many, many years, but at some point they've been able to infuse ads into the maps app 
they've been in like having aggressive enough now YouTube ads so that they are able to make YouTube profitable and they will probably find ways to get every word to be an ad within the chat and then maybe they can switch it. But until then, it's going to be it's going to be hard to have this completely new interface when they have such a fine tuned marketing uh, and ads machinery where sometimes even four, five, six ads come before any real organic content. Um, it's just very hard to move away from. It's like, you know, they make probably $150 million a day or something, or no, sorry, $500 million a day. Um, I think are estimates that, that I've seen, uh, if you say well, even just replacing four of those or two of those ads with this incredibly useful summary is going to make people click less on those ads. And, and they immediately have to like fire 40,000 people because they don't have the money anymore. Then the stock goes down. It's a, it's a, it's a tough situation to be in. And, um, you know, I, it's still an amazing, amazing place to be. They're still the monopoly. Um, right. And they have these massive partnerships where they are able to pay $15 billion to Apple to be the default. But, uh, you know, there's, it's an opportunity now, uh, the first time I think in the last decade that user sentiment has changed from Google is most amazing thing ever to like, you can actually do a lot better. So, uh, tell me about better, uh, the other business opportunities that come with not just generative AI, but how generative AI ties in with other emerging technologies, big data, IOT, uh, and other um, business drivers. Yeah, I think it's a super exciting time now. Uh, we're basically combining the best of search with the best uh, of chat and the best of generative AI inside you.com. And concretely, you'll see that for certain kinds of queries. You can generate an image with AI right directly within your search results. If you ask, how do I generate an essay? You can just create the essay right there. Those are our first uh, accomplishment apps where we are excited to allow the user to just solve the job that they're asking their search engine to do when they make that kind of query. Uh, that's the power of generative AI. And then with chat, there are just new kinds of capabilities that you don't have uh, in a traditional search engine that are almost outside in the Venn diagram. There's some overlap between chat and search, but there are also some new things like you wouldn't ask your search engine to write an entire HTML website for you with a commenting function or something like that. And some JavaScript code, uh, because you know, a list of links is not going to do that for you, but a chat engine will be able to generate all of that, uh, and help you accomplish the task as a programmer, as a student. Uh, and, and so on. So there are a bunch of exciting new use cases. And that's also where we see a lot of growth. We have a ton of students and developers on the U.com platform. So um, last question, Richard, scale this up. Uh, everyone is, is uh, kind of fascinated by the novelty of this technology, but also talking about these big picture um, AGI topics. So what is the path from uh, generative AI to AGI. Is there any? Is it just stuck at being dumb, or is this the first step? Yeah, it's interesting. We we keep moving the goalposts for what AI means, and now we just we've moved it so much. We call the new goalpost AGI, and then maybe after that, now people differentiate AGI and the singularity and super intelligence as yet another goalpost, uh, maybe to come after that. But. The idea of artificial general intelligence, and maybe for now we'll just uh, assume people mean super intelligence with that too, um, is that the AI will be so much more intelligent than humans that it will take over the world and maybe become an existential threat to humanity. And to me, there are just a ton of similarities or an analogies from history where you can say, look, this steam engine is already infinitely stronger than a human. Does it mean it can now subdue a human? No. The internet's already in, infinitely faster at communicating uh, than a mere human would be. Can it now communicate so much faster that it will take over humanity? No. Um, it's, uh, oh, this is really cute. Um, <laughs> if the dog now jumps on you and then your wife runs into the room and drags out the dog, we'll, we'll have a viral moment. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and likewise, this AI, this particular one, it can write incredibly well what you ask it to do. Does it mean it wants to write by itself? Does it mean it develops a mind of its own? No, just like the steam engine didn't, the internet didn't, um, and past AI models didn't, 
large language models will also not have a mind of their own to say, oh, now I want to subdue humans because I want to predict the next word. And guess what? The best way to predict the next word is if there are no more words, there's nothing to be said, and then the next word is just empty. Then you succeed. Um, and you can predict the next words of humanity if there is no more humanity. But yeah, like these large language models will just predict the next words given the training data that they have. So I think people get a little bit overly excited and there's a lot of anthropomorphization um, and sort of anti-hype hypers who, you know, increase their, their profile by, by throwing out these really interesting sci-fi ideas um, that honestly will probably make for a fun movie, especially in the Western world. But, you know, are they actually realistic? Uh, I really don't think so. I'm Dan Patterson, and for more interviews like this one, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And for the latest in emerging technology innovation, make sure to visit ZDNet.com.